morning and happy Sabbath to everyone. Are you all happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Good to see each one of you. I see one of my cousins here, Arthur. Good to see you and fam. You all didn't know we were related, right? (laughs) You could ask him how after. But it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I want to thank your senior pastor for this blessed invitation to be with you and your young adults today. Um, I also want to thank your youth pastor, my good friend, Pastor Benton, for um, navigating me and working with me so that we could uh, have a day like today. And of course, our intrepid, intrepid lady of the day who helped to manage it to make this all a reality, um, Sister Lauren. Let's put our hands together for her and for your pastor and all those and our team for all that has taken place here today. Come on, you can put your hands together. (laughs) And so it is my responsibility this morning to host this talk show, this talk show with young adults uh, in your church. And of course, uh, our young adults are from the ages of uh, 20 thereabouts to 35 plus. Let me see the hands of those of you who fall within that category. Uh, sorry, who stand within that category. <laughs> Let me see the uh, 36 to mm, 55. <laughs> you, uh, you're considered young at uh, middle age. Let me see those, who, those of you who are from 55 to 105. There you go. You're young at heart. Everybody say hallelujah for the young at hearts out there. <laughs> but today we're concentrating on young adults, young adults who... Uh, within our church, and young adults are a rare species. They're a rare species because many of our churches are losing our young adults left and right. And we want to find out from these lovely young people, uh, many of whom I've met in the uh, ACF cohort, the ACF ministry, and they've all been active at certain points in the ACF ministry. Here they are as young adults. Some of them are, might be in school, and we're going to get to get to that. So before we do, can you put, her, put your hands together for Mr. Rashid, whom you heard on the keys. When I get to heaven, I want to learn how to play just like that. <laughs> we also have, of course, Lauren, whom you know. Let's put our hands together for her. We also have Hannah, who did the opening prayer this morning. Let's put our hands together for her. And we also have Lashona. She is currently the president for Cornerstone ACF. Thank you so much. So tell us, tell us, um, you don't have to tell us your age now, your name now, because I just said what your, your, your names are, but uh, how old are you and why are you that age? <clears throat> why am I that age? Okay. <laughs> um, I'm 22 and um, my parents decided to have me in 99, so. That's and you had about. nothing to do with yeah, that. I had nothing to do with it. So, yeah, that's <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Rashid. Um, I'm 23, and same answer, because I, I was born in 98, I guess. So. All right, all right. I'm 21. Yeah, same answer. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> I'm 20. Uh, my parents just, yeah, decided to have me in 01, so. <laughs> all right, all right. So what, what school are you all attending? What school are you all attending? I'm um, graduated, I guess, um, but I was attending Mohawk College. Okay. Uh, and what were, you, what were you studying there, Mohawk? I, um, I was studying um, auto service tech, so fixing cars and stuff like that. So. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rasheed. Um, I'm a graduate as well. I graduated last year from Ryerson University, and now I'm in the School of Life, <laughs> and I am working full-time in broadcast media. Wow. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lauren. Yeah, like I mentioned, I go to McMaster University. I'm studying automation engineering, and I'm in my fourth year. Close. Something like overlap, overlap. Uh, All right. (laughs) Um, I also go to McMaster. I'm in my fourth year of my honors biology degree, doing a minor in globalization studies. Awesome. Amen. Amen. So let's let's start off. Let's start off with some a couple of questions. Um, The general component of uh, topic for these uh, questions are uh, is sorry why are you in in the church why are you in the church so a couple of questions uh, basic yes or no a question do you believe the church can play a role in keeping young adults in the church and anyone can jump on in the floor is open for any of you who would like to go first 
Yeah, I believe. <laughs> I think we all, I think I can speak for us all. I think we all believe that um, young adults definitely have a role to play um, in the church for, for various reasons, um, especially because we're going to be the ones who are going to be the official leaders one day. So we, we should start training from, from, the, uh, from now. <laughs> Absolutely. Amen. Thanks, you. Thanks, Lauren. What about anyone else? Uh, yeah, I agree with Lauren that as young adults, you know, we're going to be the future. And so uh, we should be, you know, taking over some of the aspects of the church program. And just like you saw today with praise team and doing like the welcome and all of that, uh, because we're the, the church. <laughs> awesome. Very good. Anybody else? Yeah, again, I, I have to agree. Um, I think it's important to have that representation, especially for a demographic, not only just for the involvement itself, but just to inspire others of our same age group to be active and participate and just, you know, have a place for our particular age group to, to feel space right. and, like, be welcomed, right? So. Very good. And what about you, sir? I mean, I agree with all of them. You know, they covered it all, so, yeah. I got none to add. <laughs> Very good. So yours is detail. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. What about, what about uh, if someone were to meet you at the, in your place of work or um, in your community at home, at school, um, and they ask you if you're a Christian, what would you say? Yeah, I'd tell them definitely I'm a, I'm a Christian, I believe in God, um, tell them about my beliefs and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I'd give them a little, a little background, I guess. Okay. Uh, you would be uncomfortable sharing no, at all? Not at all, no. Awesome. Awesome. Anybody else? Well, I've definitely gotten that question. Like when I started at university, um, people asking, "Oh, like what do you believe?" And um, I wouldn't just say Christian. I'd say Seventh Day Adventist because, you know, they'd be like, "Oh, what is that?" Um, I would just give them a little rundown. Um, but I would really try to focus on like Jesus um, because I feel like with so many Christian denominations, people will be like, "Oh, what makes you so special? From what makes you different from that um, denomination? From that one?" And I really just try to focus on the fact that. You know, at the end of the day, it's, it's about Jesus. It's, a, it's about the gospel message. It's about what he's done for us. Um, uh, the love that we show as we are in, interacting with people on a day-to-day -day basis. And so when people ask me that, like, I'll, I'll let them know I'm seven-day Adventist. But, like, I'm a follower of Jesus. And I let them know, like, what that exactly means. Awesome. Anybody else? What, what makes you Christian? What would you say to that person who, who does ask? Yeah, I think like the the basic definition to me is someone who is a believer um, in Christ, and not just so that not just like believing. Okay, he was a person because yes, history can prove that the person Jesus Christ did exist. But rather, I believe that he is my savior, and that he came to, um, to die on the cross to save even just my, myself from all, all of us from our sins. So I think that's like my basic idea of really what it means to be a Christian and a believer in Christ. Awesome. Thank you so much. What about you? Yeah, similarly, I think it just means to, to be a believer, be a follower of Christ, right? Not only to serve him, but, you know, to embody him and represent him everywhere we go. And I can definitely say that, yeah, before when people used to ask me, I'm Christian, yeah, I'm Christian. And then I was like, kind of the end of the conversation and I wouldn't go any further but you know as I've grown as I've been a part of you know these different ministries I can definitely now you know open up more be proud to represent who I am who I believe in and who Christ is and what he means to me awesome has anyone ever come up to you without asking if you're a Christian just say to you I think you're a Christian you look like one of those has anybody ever done that I've gotten the opposite. Really? <laughs> like, you're Christian? I'm like, yes. <laughs> but that doesn't make you feel uncomfortable. No, it's just like, I, it, it was kind of like a, a, a point for me to be like, okay, I think I need to represent him better, right? I need to show, I need to live a better lifestyle or live, embody him more. And yeah, it was kind of like a wake up call for me. Yeah, I think like the I think that our like this age group, even the idea of someone really assuming someone is a Christian, they would have to be like 100% like fully almost irregular from their peers because there isn't a lot of um, knowledge on really what it means to be a Christian unless someone is like praying t 10 times a day or was saying thank you Jesus every five minutes. So yeah, like it's an interesting question because I think that our age group is very secular and irreligious. Um, and so to be 
to have a peer ever say to me like, oh, you're a Christian, right? I'd be shocked. I'd be like, well, what made you think this? Was I acting really, like, was I acting against the norm? So, yeah, it's an interesting uh, perspective. Good, very good. And Lashoni, you, you just mentioned, um, what about, you know, if, when the conversation comes up about being Christian and then the Adventist idea of Christianity comes up, um, what, would they, what would you say if they asked you, you, you started that part of the conversation, but what would, you, what would you say when they ask you, or if they ask you, what's the difference between an Adventist, a Seventh-day Adventist, and a Christian? Or is there a difference? Yeah, so um, it's so interesting because when I first started university, I always, on my Instagram, on the Sabbath, like I always I'll tend to say happy Sabbath on my stories, and a lot of my fellow students, journalism students, were seeing that, and there's a, a large Jewish community that was also a part of uh, my program, and people were like, oh, like, are you Jewish? And I was like, no, 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 no. Um, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, and I think the common phrase after I say that is, what's that? Because it's just not something I think, especially in North America, that's really known about. Um, and so, what I, how I kind of like distinguish it, especially to people who really don't have that knowledge of the different um, denominations within Christianity, I say, you know, Seventh Day Adventists. One of our biggest um, things that's a little different than mainstream Christianity is we do keep the Sabbath day, which we believe to be the seventh day, Saturday, as our holy day, which is kind of similar to what the Jews do, right? right. And then my second thing is we have a focus on, you know, the second coming of Christ. Those are, I think, our two kind of main things that really differentiate us from other Christianity is our focus on the sooner coming of Jesus and the Sabbath um, as Saturday. Awesome. Thank you. What about you? Um, yeah, I, um, I've, I've been asked that question a lot, actually, um, by my coworkers and stuff like that. And for me, I, I usually just tell them, like, like day of worship, obviously, um, I, I usually go back to creation, uh, seven days and stuff like that. And it, it's interesting because, like, people people know that, like, people know the seven day week is from Sunday to Saturday, right? And so it's always interesting to hear their responses and stuff like that in regards to like why people worship on Sunday and whatever. But like, yeah, no, I usually tell them like. Um, seven day Sabbath. Um, again, we look forward to the second coming of Christ. Um, and then sometimes I go into the little things because they usually ask me stuff like what we eat, for example, right? Like, oh, you guys are allowed to eat shrimp or all that stuff. And it's like, like, no, that's not, that's not um, part of my religion and stuff like that. But um, like Lashona said, I always try to tie it back to the main focus, which is God, essentially right. worshiping God and stuff like that, because that's the most important thing, right? And so um, that's usually how I, yeah, how I go about responding to someone like that. Thank you. Um, here's another one. If, which one is more relevant for you as a young adult? Is it to say, I identify as a Seventh-day Adventist or identify as a Christian? Or identify as a Christian Seventh-day Adventist? <laughs> personally, um, personally, I identify as a Christian, right? I have my beliefs 100% Seventh-day Sabbath and stuff like that, but like, like I just said, um, 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 like Jesus is the goal, if you know what I'm saying, right? And so, like a mindset that I have towards like um, talking to my coworkers and stuff like that is um, I'm not trying to like necessarily, yo, come to church this Saturday, blah, 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 whatever, whatever, because like, yeah, you could come to church, but it can mean nothing to you, if you see what I'm saying, right? Like, like you have to like, impact them like with the word and stuff like that you know what I mean with with the knowledge of who God is and who and who and like what he's done for us and stuff like that and that stuff like what he's done for us and whatnot it's like like I don't want to say it doesn't have to do with the day of worship but like at the same time it, it kind of doesn't you know what I mean like at the end of the day he died for seven day Adventists he died for Pentecostals he died for Sunday worshipers all of those people you know what I mean and so um yeah uh yeah that's it awesome Awesome. What about you? Anyone else? Um, no, it's great. Great. I'll say, like, as you said, like, the last one, which was, like, I'm Christian, um, specifically Seventh-day Adventist, and I feel like just building off of Rashid's point, I don't want them to get distracted with all the can and cannots. Um, they'll be like, oh, you can't do this, or I heard you can't do that, right? And it takes away from the focus. And I'll be like, yeah, yeah, um, you know, there are things that we don't do, but I always go into why, and then again, relating it back to, to God. Um, try to keep the focus on, like, 
as a Christian, like my belief is in Christ, um, sharing that gospel message of like what he's done because as Rashid said, that's what's gonna transform people. Um, not, the, oh, this is what we eat, don't eat, this is how I dress or whatever. That's not gonna transform people. What transforms people is like that encounter with Jesus. And so I try to um, always steer the conversation back to that when they do ask, but I, I like to say, yes, I'm a Christian, specifically Seventh-day Adventist, and then get the question Lauren um, said, which is, oh, what's that? Because <laughs> mm. the, the catch, having a conversation about what you can't do can often be off-putting, I would assume, right? Okay. All right. Anybody else? Chime in. Yeah, I think that when I'm in, like, more of a secular, worldly situation, I definitely just would say, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian, um, just because I think that already differentiates me from a secular environment. Um, however, if I'm with a lot of people that I know are from other denominations, then I would definitely say, yeah, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, and then I think that's a way to witness about like my own denom my own beliefs within this particular denomination. So I think it just, for me, it depends on who I'm with and what I think the most impactful statement will be with that person. Right, awesome. Yeah, um, I guess for me, I'm more relatively lean towards just saying I'm Christian. Um, I just, for me personally, I feel like the, yeah, the can't and can't not do, like, all of those things just cause a lot of deviation, right? And, again, like you said, it's kind of off-putting. Um, so, yeah, I'd rather center it back to Christ and, and what it what it's all about, really. So I keep it I keep it to, you know, Christian. And then if people really ask, then I go forward and, and kind of let them know what uh, SDA is all about. But for me, it really is about community and where you find Christ, where you feel comfortable, whether that is in the SDA community, whether that's Pentecostal Baptist, wherever you find Christ, wherever you find that relationship with him, I believe that's your place to be. Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, how many of you were raised Seventh-day Adventist? Okay, and how did the church help to form you into the person that you are in terms of your Christian belief, your Christian walk? Or did it? Or did, uh, did it not? Feel free to share. This is an authentic conversation, <laughs> brothers and sisters. So yeah, feel, um, no, there's no right or wrong answer. <laughs> I went to a few different churches growing up. Um, I went to Hamilton Mountain Church as a kid. Um, and then I moved to British Columbia in my middle school, high school year. So I went mm. to um, a church out there. So I think that the church did actually a, a really good job in that age, in that age range. Um, in that age range being like little children um, into kind of that early teens because I think that they're just an easier group to deal with in general though okay. because they're, they're more moldable. Like they, they're, they're still dependent. Um, their brains are still developing, all of these things. And so I think they actually do a good job at providing, or I felt they did a really good job at providing programs, being in the children's choir, um, having AY, having gym nights. So I think that they did a great a great job, especially when I did live um, in Ontario as a child. I only have positive memories of the church. Um, in British Columbia, same thing. It was a little different because there wasn't any youth in my church. So, and I went, I transitioned from Adventist school to a public school when I lived in BC. So from the years of 13 to 18, you know, I didn't really have um, any Adventist friends just because at my church there really wasn't anyone. Um, but that being said, I think they still did really try to reach the youth age group. Um, so yeah, I, I think that the, my experience has been mostly positive. Awesome. Uh, yeah, for me, I never went to like Adventist school. I was always in public school since elementary all the way through high school. And it, it, they're really opposing environments, right? The church <laughs> versus, you know, being in that environment. And, you know, although you explore many different things, I think the church, even though I wasn't always present, I think it really did a good job of instilling uh, those fundamental, uh, you know, morals, beliefs, ethics in me, whether I was living them or not, um, they were always in, you know, my heart and, and inside me. So I think, yeah, the church ultimately did a really good job at setting the foundation for who I am as a person, who I am as a Christian, um, and whether that was evident at the very beginning or not, I think it did make an impact at the end of the day. Just to pause, did you feel like you were missing something because you didn't attend our Adventist school systems all the way up to, now you're in university, so 
Yeah. Do you feel like, man, I wish I had that experience that some of my friends have spoken about? Yeah, well, in the moment, I was like, no, I don't want to go to that. <laughs> I don't want to go to Christian school because, you know, you, you're living in, in the moment. But now that I'm older and I look back and I compare my experiences to other people's, I was like, man, I wish I could have gone, right? Because, no, I definitely, I feel like there was a part of that that was missing. And it, it's really positive to see the impact that it has when it's instilled in the education as well. So, yeah, I, I missed out, but, you know, I'm here. So it's okay. All right. <laughs> Maybe God is calling you to be a Paul, <laughs> in a sense. <laughs> Lashona. Okay. Uh, sorry, Hannah, I found that really funny you are saying, because... I think as a kid, I wanted to go to public school at some point um, because I felt like I kind of grew up in this, my aunts call it the Adventist bubble. Like you go to church on Saturday and then like five days a week you're uh, in the Adventist school. Sunday you got Pathfinder meetings. So it's just like, you know, um, the same people. And I, I guess a part of me wonders what it would have been like if I had met um, non-Adventist people, like non-Christian like people in general, and like how I would have and interact with them. I have that opportunity now in university, but it would have been interesting. Um, but just going back to your original question, yeah, uh, Adventist growing up, uh, I think the church did a really great job uh, when I was a kid, uh, setting that foundation. Again, I went to Crawford, so Adventist school. Got a really good foundation, uh, understanding of the Bible. Um, but I'm gonna be honest. When I, I call this the lost years. Um, this is just something I, I think about uh, because I work with like youth at my church doing like Bible study and on AY, and what I see is once they hit like I want to say maybe ten, uh, maybe like eleven, twelve, around all the way to like fifteen, we kind of lose them, and I personally felt that because I was too old at that point for the children's program. I didn't want to hang out with the six-year-olds, but at the same time, like, was I invited to the youth events? No. Like no one said, oh yeah, come to this. They'd always be like, this topic's a bit too much for you. And so we kind of lose them at that age. And um, I am thankful for, and you know her, Auntie Toya, she's our Metro East leader. Uh, she maintained a relationship with myself and all of my friends like in that same age group while we were that age. So it did help to keep us tethered. Like she said, you guys come up doing praise team. Um, if you don't want to be in children's choir, you know, she gave us more opportunities to do what we loved. And so I appreciated that relationship that helped me stay connected. Um, but I feel like sometimes we can lose some kids if we don't have that relationship with them. At that age, it's like they're trying to figure things out. Uh, they start thinking about themselves and thinking about the world. You know, peer pressure becomes really serious at that age. And so, you know, you want to have a strong relationship, not just giving them uh, Sabbath school and like a foundation, but like, like, do I know you? Like, do you know me? Um, can we have conversations? Can I come to you and trust you when I'm like confused about something? And I feel like that's something that we should really emphasize in the church. Awesome. So, so the school system, uh, relationships, being involved, that's, those are some of the components that allowed you to stay within the church yeah, absolutely. Uh, fellowship. Okay, awesome. Some good answers. What about you, sir? Um, for me, I, I think the church did an all right job. Um, I, was, I was between two churches, but um, yeah, for the most part, like, lessons and stuff were engaging. I, I remember like, what, three, three different people who, um, who were really intentional with like us as youth and stuff like that. Um, and they used to, you know, always plan stuff for us like outside of church too, you know what I mean? Just to keep us connected and keep us engaged and stuff like that. And, and, um, and I feel like that, like, I don't want to say pushed me, but it gave me like a, I don't know, a, like a, a bit of motivation, I guess, to like be persistent, you know what I mean? To come, you know, prepared, know my lesson study and stuff like that, you know what I mean? To, to engage in the, in the different like um, discussions and conversations and stuff like that. So yeah, I, I think they did like pretty, pretty well. Awesome. Can I ask you a question? Well, I've been asking a lot of questions already. <laughs> how many of you have been baptized? Okay, how many of you <clears throat> got baptized? <clears throat> how, how could I ask this question? How many of you got baptized? but you didn't feel like you felt like you had a relationship with Jesus Christ. How many of you had that context? Or in that context, sorry. Yeah, okay. At what point did you have an encounter and said, 
I am now your own. I'm now fully committed. I know you more, and I'm fully committed to you. But when did that happen for you? Well, um, I, would, I would say for me, like, honestly, probably like, like last year, probably, or the year before. What year that, and, and tell us the, different, the years between the time when you felt and you knew for sure between that point and the point that you were baptized. How many years was that? Um, well, I got baptized. See, the thing is, I can't remember when I got baptized, to be honest with you. Um, maybe, I think I was, was I 10? Maybe, maybe 10 or 11 or something like that. Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't remember, to be honest with you. But between that, like, stage, like, it's not, I'm not going to say I, like, I was, like, disconnected or whatever, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Because, like, I, that, like, I still loved God and stuff like that, but, like, like, it's one thing to, like, yeah, you can love God, but, like, are, you, are your actions following that love, if you see what I'm saying? You know, are, are you, like, living that Christian lifestyle and stuff like that? And, I mean, yeah, you're 11, 12 years old or whatever, but still, like, you could still, like, you know, um, live according to his will and stuff like that. And for that gap, I would say I was just, like, like floating, like, just chilling. It was, it was whatever, you know what I mean? Show up to church, um, you know, do my thing and whatnot. And, um, yeah, and then, yeah, probably a couple of years ago, I was like, let me actually, like, get into the Word and stuff and stuff. So yeah, I would say probably like two years ago is when I actually like fully committed, so to say. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Anybody? Uh, Anybody else? Mine is February of 2019, like specific. Um, so I guess growing up in the Adventist church, in the school, like uh, everything became so common. Um, like, you know the Bible verses, you, you, you know the stories and everything. And I guess it never really, like, changed my heart. Like, I knew about Jesus. I'm just like, yeah, Jesus loves me. And, yeah, I love God. Like, I know about him and I believe in him. But it, it never did anything. Like, I would always feel, after the pastor preached, you know how they do the, the altar call, they do the appeal. And I'd always feel, like, it's something on my heart to go up. And I'd be like, no, I'm not going up. Like, I, I don't want to go up. And, like, what are my friends going to think? What are people going to think if I go up? Like, what's, what's that? And so I always felt it in my heart, but there was that, there's a disconnect uh, for a very long time. And um, I got baptized, I think like nine or 10. It's very common to get baptized that age, I guess. And I just remember when I was in my first year of university, like, oh my goodness, it's, it's stressful. <laughs> very stressful, it's a huge change. And um, I mean, I share this story with a lot of people, so some of you guys might have heard it, but basically like, there was a lot going on. I was very stressed, just like, with making friends and like grades, grades, um, like maintaining those family relationships. I didn't really know anyone else at the school who was Adventist. And so I would go home a lot of the weekends and the weekends I was there, I wouldn't really go to church. I would just stay in my room because I'm like, I don't want to go by myself. And I just remember February, 19, February 2019, everything kind of just came crashing down. And I was just like, there's so much that I was stressed about as God, like, where are you? And I won't get into it, but basically like, a friend of mine sent me the song, uh, Let Go, Let God. And in that moment, I just realized like I'd been holding on to so much for so long and I needed to just like let it go and trust God, not worry about it anymore. And I think that's like where God met me because I'm like very, like always stressed out. Like from, I was a kid, I was always stressed about everything. And God just like met me at that point. He's just like, I see this as something that's like, dis like it's disconnecting us. So like, let's fix that. And I think from that moment, I learned how to trust God. Uh, 2019, February of 2019. Um, that was like the, like the 180. I can't even explain it to you. It's one of those things like I can't even wrap my head around. I can't even put it into words. It's just like a, this change that happened. I saw like, you know, I was so at peace, I guess, with everything that was going on. Um, and just seeing how like God has used me over the past two years since then. Um, it's just been amazing. I can't even really put it into words, but like that changed has happened, so it's like a, I guess a nine, 10 year gap from when I was baptized to when I fully like encountered Christ for myself. Wow. Very well, very well. Very instructive, enlightening as well, both. Ladies in the middle, go ahead. Yeah, um, I got baptized when I was 13. So yeah, around around that same time. And I don't think it was until, what year are we, 20, 20, 20, 2020, when I fully like committed myself. Um, and yeah, similar, similar to these guys, honestly, it was, it was their influence. 
more than anything because I, I always had like this notion that, okay, maybe when I'm older, I'll probably get more serious or I don't know, maybe older people just like connect with God better or something like that. I had that type of mentality. And for the longest time, yeah, I was kind of just floating. I came to church, heard the sermon, went home, didn't really apply it. And again, there wasn't much representation or I wasn't putting myself in the areas where I was represented, where my age group was, and it wasn't until, I mean, these guys were persistent, and they were like, come out, come out, and I finally decided to join one day, and just got to witness for myself the impact that God had in people of the same age as me, and that's what moved me, and that's when I was like, okay, God, I'm going to let you in, and once I did that, it was just, mountains were moving, and everything, like Lashona said, it was a complete 180. And that's what I love about today is just testifying to the fact of, of what influences can really do. And if you're an influence for Christ, it's probably the biggest reward for the other person who's receiving as well as yourself. So I think, yeah, it wasn't until, yeah, around last year when I fully committed to this whole ministry and these people who are now my family. Wow. Yeah. Very good. Wow. Are you all enjoying? It's powerful. <laughs> yeah, um, I was baptized in 2018, so I was 17. Um, and I think, like, when I was baptized, like, I knew that the main thing was that I did accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Mm -hmm. And maybe I, I didn't know everything. Um, and, of course, I was still in grade 12. I was still in high school living with my parents. I hadn't really, you know, experienced the world. <laughs> so from that naive kind of bubbled like life, you know, at that time I felt like, yeah, this is what I want to do. Um, but I think much like everyone else, and I think most people, until I experienced the world, which I was able to experience the world when I left home and was in university, um, a secular university in downtown Toronto, that's when all of a sudden all the tests, you know, came. Um, and I had to question myself. I didn't um, join ACF until like two years. Um, into my university career, and I don't have an, my, my spirit is not naturally rebellious. I don't know how to really describe that, but I just, I just, I'm not someone who's really trying to go out of their way to break rules or to, if I didn't agree with something, it's just, it's, I wasn't a big party or like things like that. It just wasn't in me, I think, regardless of if I was a Christian or not. But with that in mind, I still did struggle with certain things throughout my kind of like start of young adult uh, years. Um, and for me, it wasn't until I joined um, ACF at my school, Ryerson Mustard Seed, um, that I realized, wow, like look at all these young people that were having like serious conversations about Christ. It wasn't the generic, you know, what you grew up with, Jesus loves you, this I know. Um, I, I got it, like I got that. <laughs> it was like, I get it. Um, but I was having conversations with like one of my really good friends to this day, and I was like, wow, like I've never had a conversation like this un with, unless it was with like my parents or an adult, and it was kind of about end time stuff. And I was shocked. I said, what? Are we the same What's age? What's wrong with end time stuff? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so I think like, that was the moment for me like when I joined and I was able to have these more serious conversations about my faith with other people my age and be open and honest about it that I was like, wow, like I do want to pursue, continue a relationship with Christ and not just on a superficial level. Awesome. So for the, for the church members out there, maybe others who are looking on, what, what is that, and maybe young adults who are looking on, what is that one thing, that one resource that keeps you connected to Christ, connected to him, connected to his will, fully committed, et cetera, et cetera? What is that one thing? Like besides reading the Bible? And <laughs> oh, I mean, that could I mean, be one of them. I mean, uh, you know, that's, Okay, well, I'll, I'll say two things. Paramount. I think like, um, when I first, like, committed, you know, encountered Christ for myself, like, I didn't even realize, you guys said it exactly, ACF, oh my goodness, that was a game changer because, again, meeting people my age, it was like, wait, you guys exist? Like, people my age who, who are passionate about Christ, like, they're, they're here and, like, they're on this the secular campus, like, this is amazing. And so that whole entire ministry, getting to, like, meet other students, um, like we did big ACF events, like that was so powerful because I'm like, wow, like there's a group of us who are on fire and like we can make a huge change. So that was one. And then two, I think just like 
as I like continue to encounter Christ and like meet people, um, you know, being encouraged, we, we actually had a women's group in Cornerstone and, and that was just like huge for me because it definitely got me into the word. Like that was the first time I had studied a book of the Bible and like not just read it, like studied it. Deep, and yeah. you know, it's just a thing that like, it becomes a part of like your everyday now, just like opening up the Bible and be like, okay God, like what do you want to say today? And just like actually like, reading the word. Cause I feel like in the past it would kind of just be like, do your Sabbath school lesson or do a little devotion. But like the Bible? <laughs> That hits different. That's really good stuff. So that's like the two things I feel were great resources for me. <laughs> awesome. And just for, thanks, Alicia, and just, just for just clarity, ACF is Adventist Christian Fellowship on public campus. That's out of the youth ministry, um, youth ministries department. And it's set up specifically for young adults or youth who are on the public campus because as some of you may or may not know, we have about 70% of our young people who attend public campuses when they, when they attend their university, when they are about to get into their university experience. Um, but we also have 30% of our young people who attend our Adventist campuses. So this was a way for the Adventist church to create a place, a safe space for our young people to be able to develop their own relationship with Christ, sustain it, and also be a missionary on their, on their public campus for Jesus Christ as well. So you may hear ACF bandied about a few times in our conversation, but that's what it is for anyone else. Yeah, I think the main thing for me is essentially what Lashona was saying, community, um, whether that is through ACF, so having that representation on campus um, and even in the church, it's just about creating an environment, a space where we're all welcome. We all feel like we're being heard, we're all represented, and, and that's the biggest thing for me, and that's what draws me to this place so much, right, is because we are encouraged to be ourselves, to come as we are with our flaws or whatever, um, and we're, we're welcomed and we're accepted, and that's what we're working on to build here as well, is more representation for our particular age group, right, because like you said, a lot of us go to uh, public universities, right, and we tend to drift and move here and there, but I think the biggest thing that keeps me going is my community, right? Having my friends, my peers, and also everyone else, um, the leaders that I look up to, right? And then I look to for guidance. Um, that's what keeps me structured, you know, and just, Centered, yeah. yeah, in here. Thank you. Anybody else? One resource that keeps you in your commitment with Christ? Ladies first. <laughs> Um, I think for me, something that keeps me connected to Christ is actually um, my flaws, because I, I realized that if I didn't have, like, Jesus as the main source in my life, you know, I would not be a good person. Like, I just wouldn't. Like, my natural nature, like, I have selfish tendencies. Tell us um, how you really feel. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like, to me, like, for me, it's, like, recognizing that if he wasn't in my life, like, I would be, I'd be a mess. Like, I, I would. If my, if my, na if my natural sinful nature took over, um, you know, I just, I wouldn't be someone I'd want to be around. So, I think just, like, honestly, sometimes when I'm in a situation and I, like, me I, I mess up and I, and I, and I step back and I realize, like, okay. Like, thank goodness, or thank God I have Christ, because if I didn't have him, like, I just see the person I would be, and I don't like that person. Lauren, I want you to tell, I want you to know that you're not alone, and I'll prove it. How many of you feel that if you didn't have Jesus in your life, you would be off the wall crazy and doing some crazy things? <laughs> right? So we're all authentic in our conversation today, and that's a great thing. That's a, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, for me, um, I kind of like two, sort of. Um, community is definitely one of them. Just having like um, a group of friends and stuff like that that share the same, um, you know, values and stuff that I do. Um, that definitely helps push me and stuff like that, and um, keeps me accountable and whatnot. And um, just the thought. Well, I don't know if it's like a. Anyways, just like the thought, knowing that like, like God is always there. If you see what I'm saying, we're like having access to God doesn't just have to be like me by my bedside, like on my knees. Like I can literally talk to God, like as I'm driving, as I'm fixing a car or whatever, you know what I mean? To me, that's like super like important and it's very special. And, and it, it, it like, it's, it's just a reminder to be honest that like God is always there and that, you know, if in the event there's, you know, my community isn't around me, like, like 
you know, he's always in reach, if you see what I'm saying, right? And so, um, yeah, I, I would say those two things for me, personally. Awesome, awesome. So each of you have different um, resources that keeps you going, and that's a good thing. Um, let's, we're, we're almost out of time, but I wanted to get from you, what, what is the church's responsibility to reach, claim, and sustain young adults in this generation? What can the church do? There's no right or wrong answer. Um, it's not a trick question as well, but uh, it's open for any of you to, to share. What do you think the church can do? What do you think the church can change, adjust, culture-wise, structure-wise, personality? I, I, you know, what, what comes to your heart as to how the church can keep you, but also think about your friends who were with you at your churches and are no longer with you, any, you, know, with you anymore. What, what can the church do? Floor's open. I would say, uh, I think relationships are most important because like, I think about like, uh, the people who I grew up with who were in church and stuff like that, and like, I mean, a lot of them aren't in the church anymore, unfortunately. And um, I feel like, I don't know, I just feel like having that, like, that person, if you see what I'm saying, like, not, not like a like, person same age, like having somebody like, like an elder, so to say, uh, mm. is actually like intentional with your growth and stuff like that, where it's not just a thing where it's like, I see you on Saturday, like, how you doing, what's up, you know what I mean? But like, you know, checking in on the week, you know, helping them through whatever struggles they're going with, you know, um, um, you know, asking them about their life and stuff like, oh, how's your school going? Yeah, I'm actually good at this subject. Let me help you type of thing. You know what I mean? Yo, let's go hoop one time. You know what I'm saying? Like, let's go, let's go for food and stuff. Like, just creating actual, like, intentional bonds and not just a thing where it's like, yeah, this guy's my teacher on Saturdays. You know what I mean? Because um, I, I feel like that's, that's what, like, I think everyone really needs, to be honest, um, is, you know, intentional relationships and, and people to, like, you know, hold you accountable and people to grow with and stuff like that. Because, like, growing by yourself, yeah, that's one thing. But growing with somebody, like, push you. It's like, it's like working out, if you see me, in the gym. You know what I mean? If you go by yourself, like, like, yeah, it's cool, whatever. You know, you'll do your thing. But if you go with a man that's, like, similar strength or stronger than you, then it's like a competition, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, it's like we're growing together, if you see what I'm saying, like, challenging each other. I feel like that's, like, that should be, like, the church towards not just young people to everybody, if you see what mm -hmm. I'm saying, you know what I mean? But especially the younger, um, the younger generation so that when they grow up and when they're our age, it's like, then our age can be that for, you know, the little ones and then the ones above us could still be it for us, you know what I mean? So I feel like relationships is so important. Like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's me. Yeah, but you, you mentioned the whole analogy of, of going to the gym, not just walking with you to the gym, but spotting you when you have to lift those weights. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. exactly. Like being a support, if you know yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much, Rashid. Anybody else? Yeah, I think we can do a better job also of trying to foster each individual's gifts and talents as, you know, we're growing up, right? Because that's what... I mean, I hope what parents tend to do with their children, right, as they're growing, seeing what they're good at, where they lie, and then guiding them to, you know, okay, what career they want to pursue. So similarly in the church, it's, it's yeah, like finding out what each and everyone's strengths are, what their weaknesses are, what they like to do, um, whether they're creative, whether they're more, they're more technical, um, trying to, you know, yeah, foster those, those abilities and then creating those opportunities for them in the church, for them to be on a praise team, for them to be in the AV section, wh wherever that is, right? Creating those um, spaces for them and encouraging them. That's, that's the most important thing because I feel like a lot of the time we have like the same people that are always doing the same thing, right? <laughs> and um, it can get tiring, right, for those same people and it doesn't allow really for any growth in, in those particular areas. So I think it's it's always paying attention to the little things, right? And being there, like Rashid said, forming those relationships, those connections from an early age so that they can start participating and feel like this is a space where they can be themselves, where they can express themselves, where they can learn, where they can grow, and then they can take those abilities that they have tuned um, in the church out into the world and apply um, as individuals and in their careers. Awesome. Thank I want to tag on to that. I like that point a lot because, like, one thing that and I, I personally made this mistake with with um, someone, but like, um, one thing that you got to realize is that, like, like, yeah, growing up, like the church—sorry, not the church—like the person 
you know, they have talents and stuff like that that they want to be able to use. And if we don't groom them, groom them, sorry, it's like, yo, the world will easily take them. You know what I mean? The world's always looking for people. Like I'm thinking of, of a young guy who wanted to play keys, right? And you asked me, yo, she teach me, teach me, teach me. I was like, relax, relax. You know what I mean? And unfortunately now, like, you know, the world snatched them up, so to say. You know what I mean? And so um, I feel like we have to go in with that mindset too, knowing that like, like, it's not just like, not to be like, what's the word? Like idle, if you see what I'm saying. Like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, he's, he, he won't go nowhere, you know what I mean? He, he'll stay here. Like, nah, the world, the world will snatch him, if you see what I'm saying. The world will snatch people, right? And so I feel like, it, um, like what Hannah said, yeah, it's super important to like, you know, groom up the young people and stuff like that and, 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 and to um, just allow them to use their talents and their gifts like in the church. So yeah, I, I really like that point a lot. Yeah, yeah you, you kind of piped up when she said uh, use, using <laughs> gifts and recognizing gifts as well. Yeah, thank you. So relationships, recognizing, and building up gifts. What about uh, you? Um, yeah, I, I love those two points. I was gonna say them, so I'm glad that you guys did. Um, another thing I want to add, uh, so recently I started a Bible study with like the youth at my church, and I think from our first study, it hit me that like a lot of us like have never studied the Bible before. Um, like they were reading it and they had so many questions. They're just like, I don't fully understand this. And like some of the verses that we were covering were verses that like we've recited in church and they were so open. They're just like, I don't really understand like what, what was John trying to say here? Like it sounds a bit off and you know, getting to have those discussions. Cause I, I remember when I was maybe like around 12, 13, um, we started this thing called Youth Connect and it, would, it was supposed to be Bible study and it, it wasn't. Bible study. It would kind of turn into like everybody just ranting and saying how they felt about something, but then we never connected it back to the word to actually get an answer. And so I think like something that's really big is, is um, teaching like young people and like I'd say even younger than me, like again, those like 12 year olds, right? When they, they leave like the children's story and they, they leave like all that children's church stuff behind, like um, showing them like the Bible is so cool. <laughs> like I didn't realize that's why I was like 18. The Bible is so cool. And um, I think what's really important is like we don't just like give them verses and, and say like memorize all of this. Or we don't just like um, give them like things to read and say okay you have to read like all seven chapters in a week and come back and tell me like answer these three basic questions. Like no like I would, I take it with like one verse at a time when I'm studying with these guys like um, one verse at a time, two verses at a time, and we break each one down because that's how you're going to, to truly understand like how the Bible relates. Like when I first started the Bible study, I was doing it with a friend and she was just like, I don't know if this is gonna work because like this may not be the stuff that young people wanna talk about. And now her opinion has completely changed. She's like, no, this stuff's really good because when you just like read it through without understanding it, like yeah, it may not sound like anything important, but when you study it, like break each verse down, you're just like, seeing how it actually connects to your life, you know? And so I feel like that's something that is really important for us to, to take on, is like really studying the Bible, not just with young people, but like anyone of any age. Yeah. And you're speaking specifically about you leading in that Bible study uh, fellowship? Yeah. Okay, good, yeah. <laughs> awesome, awesome. All right, so, so leading out in Bible studies would be one way that you could say the church could make a difference in the life of young people, uh, young adults. Yeah, another thing I want to add, like when we say the church, sorry guys, the one thing I want to add is like when we say the church, sometimes we think of like the building and we just like have this vision of like this huge congregation in a building. We have to remember that the church, are the, like it's the people. Mm -hmm. And as like Rashid said, that's why relationship is important because church isn't just like come and sit in my seat, my seat, and they sit in their seat, like it's fellowship. And if we aren't like getting to know people, if we aren't having those discussions, if we aren't fostering people's gifts, um, then yeah, the church is gonna look like a building. It's not gonna look like a community of people who care. And so I think that's something really important that we have to remember that church isn't the four walls that we're sitting in. It's, it's you, it's you. It's, it's like all of us, we make up the church. And so we have to be taking an active part. Don't say, oh, someone else will do it. If God has placed it on your heart to do it, do it. Like if he says, I want you to lead in this area or if I want you to like go and talk to that person um, who's standing in the corner over there, Masks on, obviously, socially distance. But like, <laughs> like, go and do it because like you, you are the church. You're the one who's gonna to make a difference in somebody's life. Not, not sitting in the pew and looking at a screen. It's, it's those relationships, as Rashid said, and like, you know, getting to know people so you can foster their gifts. I think that's another thing we, 
have to keep in mind. Awesome. Yeah, I think like, I mean, I think everyone summarized it very nicely. Um, I think something that's important as well is for leaders in the church to make it kind of their responsibility to be aware of what's going on in the world because, you know, the experiences that we have as young adults now are going to be different from when, like, my parents were young adults because the world has changed, cultures and values have changed um, in the world. And so for me, I think that there's a lack of understanding between young adults and ch church leadership because there's, there's such a discrepancy in our opinions and our beliefs now because we live in such a different world, um, even just technologically. I mean, having the internet, having Google on my phone to, go to look up anything I want is a different experience than you know, my parents would have had growing up and to access information. And it's information on anything. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, 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 it's one thing to say like, oh, you know, your temptations when you became a young adult was just about breaking the Sabbath, going out with your friends on Friday night. I mean, I think it's a lot bigger than that. The, you know, the, the temptations you have as a young adult in today's society go far beyond, oh, you're doing something on the Sabbath you weren't supposed to do. It, 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 they just are. And so I think it's really important for church leaders to really kind of educate themselves on the, on the lives of a regular young adult and see the content we watch, see what our friend, our secular friends are engaging in. Because if you don't understand that, we're not going to see eye to eye on many things because you're not understanding where we're coming from and we're not necessarily understanding where you are coming from because they're such different worlds now. So I think in order to really help young people, young adults, this age range, because this is when we choose to leave, because you're kind of, a, you're able to, you're an adult, uh, your parents aren't necessarily dragging you into the church. Um, this is a time for church leaders to be able to have the knowledge to speak with people in this age range um, about the real issues that are going on in the world and what we as Christians, as Adventists, our perspective on it should be. Amen. Amen. And those are all very powerful points. And I, I think when you leave this stage, you're going to say, why didn't I just say that? Something just came to mind as I'm eating lunch today. You're going to remember it, and that's okay. Maybe you want to tweet that or post it on Instagram so that it, it could, and I'm being, being, being serious, you know, you can post it um, because it would help the conversation to, to carry. Of course, you would want to tag really living so that those who are here today for the worship service, um, they, can, they can tap into it. Uh, but last question. Because it's always good to um, critique our, our, our system, our brothers and sisters, et cetera. But what would each one of you do to actual, actualize the relationship, the education that our church leaders need to have and to experience so that they can know better about the gen, because you're, all of you are Gen Zs, right? Um, to know about this age demographic and, to, and how to support them uh, from, um, your talents and using, your, using those talents and being empowered to lead and direct and guide um, and be a leader in your church community, how would each of you help to make that a reality? Because ultimately, you're not leaders of, to, of tomorrow, you're leaders of, of today. Amen? Amen. Amen? That's your last question. Me first, <laughs> holy. Um, I would say just like... Um, just like checking in for one, you know what I mean? Just um, being more open to friendships and stuff like that, to building connections and stuff. Um, like for me personally, um, let's say I'm playing for a church or whatever, you know, just pay, paying attention to like, you know, the young ones who are watching and stuff like that. Cause like they'll lurk you, you know what I mean? They'll literally sit there and watch you the whole time, right? And just making that effort to go up to them like, Yo, like, do you play anything? You want, you want me to show you a couple of things? Stuff like that, you know what I mean? Showing them, just creating that, creating that bond, if you see what I'm saying, and being intentional with it, right? And yeah, um, yeah, just checking in on people and stuff like that, and um, just creating friendships, because at the end of the day, once you create friendships, all of this stuff, like, it'll come naturally, you know what I mean? Naturally, you'll want to you'll wanna share and, like, like, interact with them and have conversations about God and stuff like that and, and um, push them and allow them to push you and stuff like that. So just creating friendships and just being more aware of your surroundings and stuff like that. And, um, and you know, just, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Amen. Thank you. 
Yeah, in terms of, of, of finding different areas, right, for people to participate in the church, I think I would start off by, you know, planning different types of events, right? Having young adults or youth even um, plan days like this or other types of events that they want to do. Um, honestly, it just all starts by the relationship and by listening, right? Because on a, most of the times we're just out here talking to people, telling them what they shouldn't be doing, should be doing, right? And feeding them all this information, but do we ever actually listen back? So I think I would start off by listening to what they like, right? What they enjoy, what they want to see. And that's really what I've been focusing on lately is getting that feedback and hearing, okay, what what is what do the people in my age group want to see, right? What do the younger people want to see? And then creating those opportunities, like having events, activities, where we can slowly start to see people come out of their shells, right? And see where people take maybe leadership or where people incline more to music or wherever it is that they fall, wherever it is that they're comfortable. Um, I would start off by doing those things. Awesome, thank you. Um, so for mine, it's just really getting young people in the word. Uh, I would say as, older individuals, like we should be in the word for ourselves um, because we can't share what we don't know. And I think another important thing is to recognize that it's not like a, a teacher-student relationship when you're doing it, it's, it's a journey together. Um, I'm like, when I'm studying with uh, my friends, like I'm learning along with them. Like, yeah, I, I put out the Zoom call and I, I organized it and all of that, but I'm learning from you guys just as much as like you guys are learning from me. It's a journey together, which is something important to recognize. Um, another thing I'd say is like, no matter what you're doing, always tether it back to the word. Whether that's like an actual Bible study, like we're opening First John chapter five today, um, or you're doing a topic, like for our FNLs, which are our Friday night Bible studies that our Cornerstone ACF Club does. Um, what did we do last? We did a dealing with failure, right? That was an interesting topic. I think like a lot of the guys um, and girls who attended, they they were like saying that like, it was really good. Uh, just like the conversations they had. And I think like something really important is when we're talking about those things, right? Dealing with failure, how does it connect to God? What does it have to do with, with God? Um, how does he like play a role in that? And I think that was something that we like um, tied into the questions that we had each group like read and, and answer um, because it's important that we don't just like talk about it and like, yeah, it's important that people give their opinions and, and say like, this is what I think, but what does God say? Um, because that's where the answer is going to come from or else we're going to leave maybe even more confused than when we came. And so it's always important to like, no matter what you're doing, um, make sure, don't even just like throw God in like a little sprinkle at the end. Um, center it around him. Like this is dealing with failure God's way. Like how do, how do we approach it? Um, how do we like make sure that God is in it? You know, so like things like that, making sure it's always tied back to Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Lauren, what about you? Yeah, I think... Um just being, for myself, just being honest and open with my leaders and the, my current leaders in the church um, about anything that they've ever asked me or if I've had questions, I think is really important because um, through that dialogue, then things can transition and change for um, the better, at least for the young adults. Um, so yeah, I think it's really just important to have an open, honest dialogue um, especially as young adults speaking to church leaders about how we feel um, and the reasons why we feel that way because I think there's an, um, a negative connotation around young adults that all we want to do is just have drums on the stage and that, that's it. I feel like that's like one of the, the main topics and they think that it's just anarchy. Um, and so, you know, it's deeper than that, right? I mean, young people who choose to stay are here for a reason. We obviously love Christ and we want to be involved, um, but we can't be involved unless church leaders are listening to us. So just um, being open and honest and, and hopefully having a, an open ear. Amen. Amen. Well, what do you all think? Can we put our hands together for these fine young people here today? And we had a number of other questions, but we know that you're hungry and you want to get, get home. So thank you so much, Rasheed. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you so much, Hannah. Thank you so much, Lashona. And uh, maybe we should do a part two. Uh, let us know, and we'd love to, we'd love to participate in that. Because um, I think this is just surface. We can get even deeper with it. Um, but my closing message to you today is this. Um, 
when you get home, read John chapter 9, verse 1 through 34. That was going to be my uh, sermonic moment, and it had to do with a young man whose eyes were, he was blind and whose eyes were healed. Jesus opened his eyes, and the church members asked him and pummeled him with questions, quite like what we did today. And um, they cast him out because he actually believed in Jesus and he kept speaking about this Jesus. He never really knew, but he, he had an encounter with Jesus Christ. And one of the things that uh, made me, me smile in that passage was that his, they asked his parents, are you the ones? Are you, you know, yes, we're, we're his parents. We know he was blind. We gave birth to him, all that. But we don't know, of, we don't know the experience. He's of age. You go ask him. And that passage really speaks to me and I think speaks to all of us in that our young people in our midst are our jewels. Everybody say jewels. They are, they are special to us. And they are special to God, even if we sometimes don't feel that they're special to us. And that passage teaches me a couple of things. Number one, youth have value. Everybody say value. They're valuable unto God because God created and and, and made sure that they are here today. Can you say amen? They could have been elsewhere, but our young people are right here. They have value. They're valuable unto God, but they also have vision. And if you heard from every single one of them today, as you will in your, in your quiet moments with your family and friends, with, with young people around, you will hear from their deep thinking and some things that they're going over in their minds. They've got vision of what the future could be, what the church could be like, but also like the parents of that young man who said, why are you asking me? Go ask them. They have voice. You speak to them. So our young people of today have vision, they have value, and they have voice. And by the way, they're all old enough to vote. They have vision, value, voice, and they got vote. So let's pray for them. Let's lift them up in our prayers, not just these lovely four, but all the young people in our midst and the young people in the world who are doing awesome and big things for Jesus Christ, not for their, not for their glory, but for the glory of God Amen. and for the benefit of the world.